Okay. I think we are up and running. You know the drill, guys. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. And let's swap over so you can see me as well. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. How are we all doing? Let's have a look and allow time for you guys to get in here. Let's get that. And the usual technical setups. Let's just ensure that everything's working and I've set it up all good. If you are here, give me a little thumbs up, give me a little wave, let me know you are here. That would be greatly appreciated. There you are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Foreman. Appreciate it. Flash, how are you going? Thanks for the thumbs up. Thanks, guys. All right, good. Good, good, good. Got a little bit of one to run through today, which is, which is nice, considering last week was very all over the shop. We didn't really have much to go through. Today, there are a few topics I wanted to talk about, uh, which, which I'm excited to have a chat about and, and some things that we're working on in the future and hopefully things that are going to get a little bit better. How you guys been? How's your trading week been? I think we do have a bit of a delay, which is, which is okay. But it's not that big of a deal. About 10 seconds. How's your guys trading week been? We'll sit down for a little bit longer and wait for uh, wait for the rest of the crew to come in before we, we get talking so no one misses anything. And then we're going to dive into some charts. We're going to have a look at a different series, which I've been asked to have a look at. Um, in the in the discord as well um, as well as play on the aussie dollar coming up which i want to share that's correct diego i live in melbourne i live in melbourne australia probably tell by the uh by the accent there right you took a couple after having a bit of a break nice woman how was the break did you find the break working all right was it, was it good flash you had a good awesome awesome hi fred welcome fred how you doing Nice to see you. Are you from uh, Are you from Australia as well, Diego, or you just recognise the accent? Yeah, you lived in Sydney. Ah, oh, fantastic. Yeah, lovely. Don't live Don't live in Sydney anymore. All right. Anyone over on the Trading View, give us a thumbs up. Let me know you're over there. It's always a bit quieter over there on the Trading View, but. Let's just ensure the chat's working so um, I can see you. Good to have a step away from time to time. Yes, it is. It is very good. It's nice to have a breather and reset and then come back in, you know, reanalyze why you're here trading, reanalyze what your goals are. Sometimes you need to take a step back, take a step forward. So I'm proud of you for doing that. Well done. You lived in Sydney for a while. You're from Brazil. Oh, lovely. Lovely. Good to see you too, Fred. Glad you're here. I did get your emails, Fred. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll address them after my live stream, okay? Uh, I will get back to you on that. Um, I sure it, there's nothing like what you're suspecting that has, that has happened. Um, don't worry about that, but I'll, I'll explain all of that for you um, at the end of the live stream for you. Okay. I'm not sure if the chat's working on trading view or we're just quiet over there, but for argument's sake, we're just going to say that it is working and eventually someone will give me a thumbs up at some point in the near future. A couple things I wanted to run through today. Now, one of them I want to wait for. Well, actually, he might already be in there because I'm not sure what his YouTube and or trading name is. Axel, right in Discord, if you're here, can you let me know you're here? Um, whatever your, your username might be because um, I'll wait to address your questions until you're here. Um, just to ensure that you get the knowledge and, and the answers that you wanted to get. So if you are here, ask someone on Discord, let me know, um, and then we'll run through your questions there. But if not, we'll, we'll carry on with, with what I wanted to go through anyway. All right, let's dive in. Okay, first thing I wanted to discuss today was the overall market condition. Right? How, how has it been looking this week? How have we been doing? What are the big kind of 
moves that we've witnessed. Now, has anyone seen any moves out there today where they're like, wow, we have just been absolutely stumped or it, you know what I mean? Or, or something's had a big move that's caught you off guard, maybe didn't see coming. Is anything in the market this week that you're thinking, okay, I did not expect that to happen? I've got two in mind. Well, not that I didn't expect it to happen, um, but I definitely didn't expect it to happen at the extent that it did. Oh, really? Okay, trading view not working. Can you try refresh that for me, Holman? Because it seems to be working for me when I click on it. Thanks for letting me know. It's frozen on starting in 57. Really? That's that's an issue. It does say there's people waiting, um, but that's running for me, so that's interesting. Phil Taylor, <laughs> the darts player. Now, uh, Phil Taylor, the GG volatile. Yeah, yeah, GJ. Um, yeah, well, the pound. That was mostly the pound, which is crazy considering the Japanese yen recently. Um, has been extremely weak and is still continuing to be. Damn, it's still frozen for you, really. Okay, that's an issue. Is anyone else's trading view stream frozen? Is anyone able to check that for me? I'm going to link it in the chat. Can a few of you just head over and check whether or not that is working? Because um, it is quiet in the chat over there. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, filter. Plenty of profits from GJ. Okay, awesome. Yeah, the volatility on the pound risk. So, uh, the past two days, the Japanese yen has been once again um, doing nothing. Right, it's been getting stomped as the the weakness of it is is still there. But we did have a solid short play on the Aussie dollar and on the pound, and I'm going to show you here on the daily chart. We're having a look at the Aussie dollar, US dollar chart here. You can see we got stumped, right? The Aussie dollar got absolutely stumped here. Why did it get stumped? Okay, we're gonna start having a look at why did we get shorted, but it also happened as we look down to the um, the pound CAD chart. You can see here, pound Aussie dollar is probably less of a movement, yeah, because they were both getting absolutely smacked. Um, but if you look at like pound US dollar once again, absolutely smacked, right? So so we had a lot of powerful. Um, in these pairs over the past week, which we predicted weakness to come through anyway. We did. We were having a look and we were like, yeah, look, honestly, these charts are probably going to be um, weak in the near future. That was a bit of an obvious one in in my opinion, fundamentally, that that, that was going to happen with interest rate rising, inflation becoming a solid uh, factor across the globe at the moment. There was a lot, a lot of different movements. Okay, I'm going to assume trading view is literally just not working because that's so weird because it's working for me. Like it says that it's streaming and I can watch the stream replay, but there's nothing in the chat. So I guess we're just streaming on YouTube today. <laughs> um, Aussie dollar Japanese when last week's close on a weekly chart with a pre-warming of what transpired this week. Aussie dollar Japanese yen on the weekly chart. The big doji, big doji candle at the top here. Um, yeah, we did break what the highs since 2017. We haven't broken the highs since 2015. Still might, still see weakness in the Japanese yen. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, we've had a very nice run for quite some time. Uh, you know, since January, we've been in a bull run. Still seeing weakness in the Japanese yen. To be honest, I think this might have trapped a lot of sellers. And it does have the potential. It's a horrible arrow. It does have the potential to still move higher from here. So we'll see. We'll see how how it plays out and um, where we go from here in terms of, of that. Was a bit of an indication of, yes, we could get a bit of shorting power. But I think most of it was down to um, the Aussie dollar you know, last week. Towards the end of last week, we had, what did we have? We had, ah, oh, something's on top of my mind. Ah, oh, the monetary policy meeting minutes, there you go. Um, and that kind of set the mood. It's working now? Oh, okay, fantastic. Thank you, Holm. Thank you for doing the, the research there. 
Is it like up to date? Like working? No, I don't, I don't know. Thank you for that, though. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, th there's a lot of hints, a lot of weakness coming in the Aussie dollar with inflation rising um, and the monetary policy. They're hinting at aggressive moves in increasing interest rates um, multiple times, not just once. Um, they're, they're, they've removed patient from their, their normal meeting um, meeting minutes. So it, it's going to be interesting to see what unfolds there when it comes down to the early dollar because it looks like they're getting a little bit um, hawky, uh, not hawkish, sorry, dovish um, in terms of the economy in here in Australia. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. So I was getting very distracted by the whole trading view thing there that I've just kind of blathered on. Um, okay, we've got people watching. It tells me people are watching because no one's talking, but that's okay. What I wanted to talk about while we're on the topic of the Aussie dollar is in about two hours, a little bit over two hours, we've got the Aussie dollar PPI coming out. Okay, We've got some news coming through on the Aussie dollar. And the reason I'm noting this is because I'm going to be trading it. And I'm going to share with you guys what I'm looking for and why I am trading it. Okay, So... Here we are, we're in the Asian session, the market's not long opened. We're going to look to get around about 11.25, where we're going to be buying a position with a very simple one-on-one -on -one risk reward ratio. Right, this is what we're going to look like in about two hours. Now, don't just blindly replicate this. I'm going to share my analysis, but please, this isn't advice. This isn't go do this, it's guaranteed to win. Um, just listen. I don't recommend trading it. Just listen to what I'm saying. Right? You've got no evidence whether or not this is going to work out or not. So please don't go trade this. The reason I am looking bullish on this data release is because earlier we had the CPI. Right? On Wednesday we had the Aussie dollar CPI, which is the consumer price index. Now the consumer price index is essentially the price that consumers are paying for the goods compared to the previous month or quarter, depending on how the release goes. Okay, So if we see a 2.1% increase, it means consumers, you and I, are paying 2.1% more for the same product or the same service than what we were the previous quarter, Okay, which obviously is a massive indication on inflation. Right? If we're paying 2.1% more, there's a good chance that inflation is going up. Now, why would we be paying 2.1% more than we were last quarter? Can anyone give me anything at all? Literally just think of the top of your head. I go in to buy a loaf of bread. It costs me $1. I go in this week to buy another loaf of bread, and it's now costing me you know, $1.10, for example. Okay, That math doesn't add up, but don't worry. I'm just throwing it out there. Why all of a sudden has it cost me more? Okay, what, what has to happen in that line for all of a sudden I have to pay more for that loaf of bread? Who makes that decision? What's gone on? Can anyone tell me that? Can anyone answer why the consumers, us, are paying more for the same thing, the same service, the same product a quarter later? It's a, it's a, it's a very basic answer, the one I'm looking for. Okay, So if you're thinking, well, this, the, um, write it because you're probably right. Okay. I'll give it a little moment to see if anyone can come up with an answer. Why are we paying more for the same thing? Can anyone read all me that? And this is just simple economics. Okay, this is just simple. Well, just everyday life. This is something we need to understand with everyday life. More money printed. Okay, you're thinking very outside the box there. Um, Kind of, not 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 the avenue I'm looking looking for, um, but I see I see where you're going. The price of oil has gone up, yeah, but is the price of oil going to affect how much I pay for a loaf of bread, or how much I pay for golf lessons? Is that going to affect much of that? Probably not. Um, but we're we're thinking very outside the box. Supply struggles, yes, it does have a have an implication, but there's a very basic answer, and you're all going to go, ah, oh, when you hear this answer, okay. Consumers, less, okay, now we're on somewhere, Bob, now we're on, on somewhere. Less supply, more demand. If there's more demand for a product, 
and less supply. Ah, oh, we're trading views working. Lovely. Lovely. Cost for the resources, the bread is comprised of has gone up. Yes. Interesting. So what you've elderly, you've actually just hit the nail on the head. The cost of the resources of that bread or of whatever it might be has gone up. Therefore, it's costing the business, the producer, more money to produce that product or that service for us. Now, almost always, if the resources costs go up, the business doesn't take the hit, the consumer takes the hit, okay? What does the consumer do? We go, we pay, we pay more because, ah, uh, you know, we go and we pay more for fuel because, ah, uh, yeah, the world, you know, they're at war, fuel costs more. And we just took that. The business that is in oil doesn't take the hit. They still make the same margin. They're like, no, the consumer will pay more. It's the world economics, right? And most of the time, that is the way. The consumers are the suckers because the business is like, no, our margins are our margins. We're going to maintain that no matter what the resources cost are. So what do the business do? The business rises their costs. The reason consumers pay more is because the producer has raised their costs. Whatever they want to use as justification for doing that, whether there are, you know, the cost of resources has gone up, maybe they need more money, whatever it might be, right? The producer has raised their costs and that's why the consumer is paying more. Well, economically in Australia, we've just been told that the consumers are paying 2.1% more, right? So what does that mean? If we just think how we just thought, well, the producers have raised their costs, right? Well, guess what? In about two hours, we've got the producer price index coming out, which is going to tell us exactly whether or not the producers have raised their costs. Now, for the CPI to be extremely hot out the gates with a 2.1%, I'm going to be very, very surprised if the PPI isn't hot as well. Okay, So I'm expecting the PPI to go up, right? which usually shows that it's good for the people who are going to want to buy into the Aussie dollar. Okay, That right there is the reason I'm going to be buying the Aussie dollar five minutes before this data comes out because the CPI was so hot in relation if consumers are paying, paying more, there's a good chance that producers are charging more. They correlate. Okay, um, The beauty with these news releases is there's like a thousand different robots out there that read this data and buy and sell instantly. If we can have a bias on that data before those robots get in, those robots can do the work for us in moving our position and we can sell the rest of our position to those robots. Okay, So that is the trade I'm going to be doing. Now, I don't usually share my trades and I don't usually share my analysis that in depth. Um, and the reason I don't do that is because I don't want everyone to just go replicate because this will maybe still lose. Okay, It can lose, right? but we've got to ensure that we have the right risk management. I don't have 100% win rate trading. Okay, um, so just don't go trade this, but I wanted to share a different way of trading of what you're probably used to, you know, drawing trend lines, drawing supply and demand. There are fundamental aspects. This whole market is driven by fundamental aspects. So there are different plays you can make, especially in the Aussie dollar, um, pretty clean ones too. I hope that that all made sense and I hope I explained that in a, in a good way for you guys to be able to understand that because... It is probably one of the most simple plays you can make on um, a fundamental trade is the previous data gave us a large indication um, that this is going to be positive data. Now, obviously, there's a forecast here from Forex Factory as well that they're expecting positive data. I think most people are expecting positive data. If about an hour before we already get a bullish move, I probably won't take the trade anymore um, because market has already priced it in. But um, keep an eye on it. If we have a look at when the CPI came out, 11.30 on Wednesday. <clears throat> Excuse me. 11.30 on Wednesday. You can see that popped in right here. That nice big green candle right here. Yeah. You can see all that buying power that went into that nice long green candle right there. Um, that was everyone's reaction to the CPI, which was obviously positive. Um, and I'm expecting the PPI to be positive from there. Okay, that was what I wanted to discuss about that trading idea. Something a little bit different. Something that not a lot of the market actually talks about, um, especially if you're learning to trade or if you're an experienced trader. You might not look at fundamentals very often. I think they're pretty important. Um, that's a potential play that which can't could 
not can't, could uh, unfold a little bit later. Let's just let's just have a look and let's have a see. But I am looking to buy into the Aussie dollar at that point in time. Low risk, low risk, right? Not not fully confident, uh, but confident enough to put risk on the table for it. Warm greetings from the Caribbean. How are you, lady? How are you going? Thank you very much for tuning in. Hello. Does that make sense? Does anyone have any questions about that? Is that just blown a lot of your minds? Have you just not thought about it that way um, before? I, I'm interested to hear your feedback on that because I know not a lot of the market talk about this type of stuff. But when we're trading prop firm money and we're trading big, big money, this type of stuff you got to know. You, you need to know this how this stuff plays in the market. You got to have a fundamental bias on different currency pairs, and usually, if you get that fundamental bias. And trade in line with that bias, um, you're going to increase your win rate exponentially. Um, so I do recommend studying a little bit in world economics. I don't have a degree in economics, but I can still understand this stuff. It just takes a little bit of practice, um, but definitely have a look. Any feedback at all? Anyone got anything to say on that? Let me know. I'm interested. I want I want to discuss. I want a discussion. Good so far. Thank you, Real Eddie. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Okay, once we've, uh, once we've got any questions out of the way, if, if anyone does, it's a bit quiet in here now, so I don't think too many people have too many questions. Um, I will run through the Discord questions that I got from Axel Rod and have a talk about that. And, uh, and see what goes in there. What is your take on gold, please? I'm still in a position for a sell. I will do some analysis on gold a little bit later. It was our chart of the week as well this week. Um, so I will have a look at that in a little bit. But chart of the week update, guys, if you like chart of the week. Uh, ben, our new support agent, Ben, is going to be um, taking over that. So he's going to be producing the charts on Sunday and then also doing a video review of all the positions. Um, this is actually going to be a really good way for you guys to get to know Ben and get to understand... Um, him as a person and how he trades and, and different analytical standpoints which which will be good because the more you get to know the people at the firm the more relaxed you can be and the more easier and open communication routes can be as well so keep your eye on for that uh ben's going to be doing a video review of all the analysis and how everyone traded that that gold chart all right no one had any questions good let's carry on um Axelrod in the Discord asked a very simple two questions. He said, would it be great to get your perspective on Aussie dollar, New Zealand dollar at the slowly hitting monthly resistance levels? And I agree that it is getting close to those monthly resistance levels. The thing I don't like about it, okay, is I'm bearish Aussie dollar. I know I'm buying the Aussie dollar in this in about an hour, two hours, right? But I am overall bearish the Aussie dollar, even if we do get good results here. But it just seems like the market is very risk assessed, right? Like that there's no confidence. There's no confidence in the Aussie dollar at the moment. And we can see that across the Aussie 200. We can see that um, in the bond market. We can see it in just the Aussie dollar itself. Um, however, it's still uptrending against the New Zealand dollar, which is kind of like the partner pair, right? Reaching monthly levels, yes, we're reaching the top of 2021. We're trying to get up to the tops of 2020, and then the next one will be all the way back in the 2018 highs. Tough area, right? We're seeing it. We we broke we broke the high, right? We broke the high there. Um, it is a matter of whether or not we can break these highs up here. It's going to be interesting to watch. Wasn't there going to be a new channel or something for the chart of the week, people? Yeah, yeah, we're going to um. Yeah, we're, we're working on that, on, on how we're going to um, manufacture manufacture that. But yeah, don't worry, that, that's coming. Ben's, Ben's working on that now. Um, so we broke those recent highs in Aussie New Zealand dollar, and we're trying to get up to these. I just, I don't like it because I'm, I'm bearish Aussie dollar, right? I just said that. So... I don't know if it can continue. The thing is, New Zealand dollar is not overly strong either. If you just look at it on against the US dollar, it's it's tough because the Kiwi dollar 
usually replicates or at least coincides with the Aussie dollar. So then when you pair them against each other, it's like, well, it's a battle of the weaker, right? At the moment, it's a battle of which one is weaker. And that's a tough battle to undergo. I personally think the Aussie dollar is weaker and I've got more of a bearish outlook, but the chart is telling me something different, right? Everyone else's perspective is obviously a little bit different. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see, did the Aussie 200 bounce recently? Let's have a look. We had a little bounce over the past couple of days, okay. Yeah, overall outlook, I'm looking for downside potential, not really looking to trade it, if I'm completely honest with you, Axelrod. Um, unsure on where it can go. Confidence is low. That's 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 what I can give you, Axelrod, is my overall perspective is confidence is low. I can see this pair going either way. Realistically, I can see it more favoring the downside, but I'm um I'm not too I'm not too sure to be honest. I'm not too sure. Your other question was your thoughts on the good old saying sell in May and go away. Well, you sell in May dot dot dot. Do you find this to be true and useful? Thank you. I see you in the chat room. Okay. Sell in May and go away. Who's heard of this saying before? Sell in May and go away. Has anyone heard of this saying before? Let's jump back on the webcam. Let's have a chat. Okay. Has anyone heard of the saying sell in May, go away? We're being very interactive today. And I think it's important that we do be interactive. Because I think if you're interactive, you're more in tune and you can listen. You can listen a little bit more. Sorry for you guys who, who prefer to sit quiet. Um, but I just want to I want to be a bit more interactive. I want to have a chat today. Bob, you've heard of sell and may and go away. Yep. Yep. But for stocks, sell and may go away. Yes, exactly right, Norm. Exactly right. It doesn't really work in Forex because it doesn't make any sense in Forex. Um, we've got two assets paired against each other. So the whole selling and may doesn't really work. You've never heard of it, Joshua? I will explain this for you momentarily. Um, okay, good, good. We've got a, got a bit of a gorge, okay? Some people have heard of it, some people haven't. Joshua, for your, for your sake, I'll, um, I'll explain what sell in May go away is, okay? Stocks tend to rally more in winter. Exactly. So the reason people, the old saying is sell in May and go away is referring to the stock market, okay? It's summer holidays are coming up in the US, in Europe. Most people go on holiday, they leave, you know, the big firms kind of break up for a couple of weeks, the, the kids are off school for six weeks, everyone goes on holiday, there's not as much volatility, therefore there's not as much buying power in the, the winter, uh, their summer months, my winter, uh, their summer months, right? So the old saying came about of sell all your stocks in May and go away and then come back towards the end of September. Um, and start looking to get back in the market. Because usually we see a flat line between the those months because it's the summer holidays, right? Well, I was asked in the Discord whether or not I think it is viable. And my answer is no. Okay. In terms of the Forex market, definitely not. Never has it kind of worked, nor will it ever work, because the Forex market, the, the two currencies paired against each other. It's different compared to the stock market, okay? Um, but the thing is, with the sell in May and go away used to be an extremely effective tool, okay? And it used to work, and it used to work every single year, and it was good advice. The thing is, technology's rapidly changed. So back when this used to work, it was when the S&P 500 was traded by American citizens and American residents, right? And kind of just them um, and the big Wall Street firms and stuff. And you couldn't access that market on your laptop, on your phone, quickly get in, buy. Yeah, you, you didn't have me sitting the other side of the world going, yeah, I'm going to buy the S&P 500 today. And I can do it like that, okay? So... Back in the day where you didn't have the technology and it wasn't a worldwide asset, right? It was mostly focused in a, as a, a concentrated American asset. When Wall Street would break up and everyone would go on holiday, yes, the volatility would disappear because everyone would be on holiday. No one else was trading it. 
But now in our day and age, that market is worldwide. And while it may be summer over there and big firms are going on holiday, over in Asia, over in here in Australia, it is the bang middle of winter. Everyone is hard at work. And we've got some big firms in Sydney. We've got some big firms in Melbourne. You know? Massive firms out in Singapore. So while that did work, while we were concentrated in that one area, looking at the S&P, looking at the Oz 200, and I'm going to show you some examples, it's no longer viable because everything is now a worldwide asset. You can access any market at any time, given that it's open from anywhere. When you go on holiday, you can take your laptop and you can still trade. When you, you can do it on a plane now. You can get internet on planes, right? And you can literally trade, sell your stocks, buy your stocks, read you know, financial reports while you're on the go. Now, when you weren't able to do that, volatility would drop. But now that everything is accessible 24-7 from anywhere and because everyone's got one of these, doesn't really stick to anymore. Okay, so I don't really believe that it is a viable strategy or something you should include in your investing portfolio because I just it's not going to work as as well because everyone the volatility doesn't disappear. While it may drop just a little bit, it doesn't disappear. So what I'm going to do is show you a couple of examples, right? And the first one I'm going to show you is because we were just talking about it, the S and P 500. If we jump into the S and P 500. Hey, what's your outlook on Jeep? Yeah, okay. I'll have a look in a sec type where I'll have a look in a sec. S&P 500, I've already gone ahead and marked out five different Mays. Okay. Five different Mays since January 2017. Now, every one of these, this one I've marked red is because this was like the whole COVID thing, right? We all know COVID happened. There's a bit of a different market condition during the uh, world pandemic. Um, so that one I've marked out red is can we really have it as reliable data? Who knows? That's up to you to decide. If we're having a look here and we sold in May and then come back in September, we missed out on 5.46% gains in 2017. Okay, And then if we did it in 2018, we missed out on 10.8% gains in 2018. Then if we did it in 2019, we missed out on 2.2% gains. 2020, we missed out on about 17%. And 2021, we missed out on about 5.3%. Every one of these for the last five years has still provided gains. Okay, If you were to sell in May and go away, you would have missed out on these easy gains. Not so much viable. Not just works with that uh, with the S&P 500 either. Let's have a look at the Oz 200 index. Very much the same thing, last five years. Okay. One of the years you would have lost. You lost 3.5% through May back in 2017. 2018, you gained about 3%. 2019, you gained about 6%. 2020, 9.37%. 2021, 5%. So while the sell in May go away used to be an extremely effective and viable strategy and a risk management process. Not anymore. Um, I think the markets have changed, the perception, the access to markets has changed. The volume, let's actually have a look. The volume still remains quite, oh, well, that doesn't help me at all, does it? Uh, let's go ahead and move in or pain. A CFD volume as well. Okay, that's not going to work the way I wanted it to. But you, you get what I'm trying to say, okay? Um, it was an effective strategy. It was an effective risk management uh, process. I don't think it is anymore. Um, I don't think it's viable anymore. I think we've, we've well and truly gone past those days where, where you can do that. Markets are 24-7. They're running all the time. Um, as we can connect, look at you guys right now. Half of you are going to be the other side of the world to me right now. And we are chatting, talking about the same market, trading the same market. And we are the other side, other side of the world to each other. That right there just shows you the amount of volatility increase we had since those days where you could literally just say sell and may go away. Um, that right there is powerful in, in its own. When Europe goes on vacation in August, the Forex market dies a bit. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. 
it depends on economic release and depends on the pair you're trading okay european pairs might die a little bit but if you're looking at like japanese yen pairs and stuff i'm not sure you're going to see a, an overall slowdown yeah. When I'm practicing my risk management, I take note of the percentage change with the position tool, the percentage increase, even though the pips remain as price increase with currency value. I either read that. Pardon? When I'm practicing my risk management with the position tool, the percentage increases even though the pips remain as price increases with currency value. Can you explain more on what you're trying to get an answer to there? I'm confused on, on I'm, not, I'm not understanding that. Sorry, uh, I, I don't quite understand your question. Um, Ty, I'm going to have a look at Great British Pound US dollar for you. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Look at that short. Look at that short. It is just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, let's go. It is really tanking, and I'm really bearish Great British Pound too. I actually had a sell position at the start of this week, um, on the 25th, which is right here. I have closed it since. Um, would have been good if I hadn't, but I have closed it since. And the reason I went short is just because my overall outlook on the pound was pretty poor. Um, if we have a look in here, I don't have it selected. Let's get the pound in here. We're probably going to see an increase in interest rates around the board as well. Public sector net borrowing went up quite a fair bit. Um, wow, that massively missed. Yeah, overall, I'm just not not confident in what the pound can do. You're currently short on it, but I think if I should close or let it run. Interesting. Interesting, because you got me interested now to find out why you're in a short if you don't know where to get out. Okay, and this is a this is an interesting topic because it depends on on how you trade. Okay, now I always have with every investment you ever do, always have an exit plan before you go in. Always have an exit plan because you'll notice that while you're in the trade, perceptions of markets can change. Different things can happen. Different things can make you move your stop loss. They can make you move your take profit and not take profits. Just let it run. You know, all these different things can make assess until the point you are now trading your P and L. You're not trading the market. You're trading your P and L. That right there is interesting in a fact of okay, why am I now trading P and L? Well. Trading P&L is actually an extremely bad thing to do because it's trading off emotions, trading off when you're satisfied. And the more and more that goes into profits, the more uptight you're going to become going, oh, I should probably take profit, I should probably take profit, I should probably take profit. And bang, all of a sudden, you missed out on taking a load of profit. So first things first, before I address anything else, I'm not yelling at you, I'm just um, discussing with you. And that's something I've learned is always have an exit plan. Whether you're investing long-term in stocks, whether you're investing in the S&P 500, whether you're in a five-minute trade, whether you're in a daily chart trade, whatever it might be, always have an exit plan. Now, that could, you could have multiple exit plans, right? You could have, okay, if we start rallying really quick, we're gonna let it run a little bit, but we're gonna trail it with this, okay? Um, if it's really slow, we're gonna reduce our risk, take off half the position. Have multiple exit plans, but for every scenario, and if you do that, then you'll never be sitting here kind of being like, oh, should I close it? Should I let it run? What should I do? Because you'll have the plan. All right? And once you're in, you can plan for every scenario and, and then react to that in accordance. So very similar to a business risk management plan. Okay, You identify the risk. You identify what you're going to do if that risk occurs. When that risk occurs, you know exactly what to do. You don't have to worry about your emotion taking over. Okay, You've got your step-to-step -step plan. That's what I recommend doing, first of all. Secondly, in terms of looking at this and saying whether or not you should let it run, it's an extremely tough question because it's moved a lot. It's moved a lot, a lot. As mentioned, to check the monthly chart, it's going to bounce a bit. We're a little bit low, um, a little bit. We need to get a little bit lower before we get down here. And obviously, we're on the monthly chart. So getting down here is still another 400 pips. Um, 
A 400 or 40? Yeah, no, that'll be, that'll be 400. Um, so keep an eye. Yeah, it's a tough one. I, I don't have any advice, to be honest. I, I, I don't know. It depends on where you got in and what you're looking to achieve. Yeah, it depends on where you got in and what you're looking to achieve, really. But um, if you don't have an exit plan, find one. Make one, 100%. Uh, okay, in December 2021, I backtested UJ and 0.04% was my average stop loss over 40 trades. But now I backtest today and it's gone up to 0.1% when backtesting this month's data. Is this because ADR has gone up? Well, has your stop loss moved? Has your... Yeah, has, has your... I'm confused. Have you moved your stop loss? Is your stop loss now a different distance than what it was back in 2021 compared to now? What do you use to gauge a stop loss? Like, um, I, I think I understand what you're trying to ask, but I can't formulate a question because I feel like the answer's in the question because I don't have all the information to answer the question. So. Apologies for the back and forth, but I, I I think I know what you're getting at, but I don't know how to answer it because I don't have all the data to answer your question, right? Because it's very personal to you. Um, so in 2021, you were back testing and you had a stop loss of whatever it was, and it was 0.04%. You had small. No, 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 that's okay. It's, you've not confused me. I, I'm just, I, just, do you base your stop loss off, off of ADR? If you base your stop loss off ADR, then yes, it's going to be very different um, trading it because we've obviously had increased volatility. And then your stop loss percentage will be different because your ADR has gotten bigger. Does that make sense? Um, someone asked before if I can have a look at my take on gold. Real Eddie, let's have a look. I who can, who participated in this week's chart of the week? Is anyone here participate in this week's chart of the week? Trader charts. Where did we come in? Um. Very mixed. A lot of people looking for shorts, a lot of people looking for shorts, some people looking for buys, some real in-depth analysis. Did anyone I base it off of pips or percentages? But I tested it off of this month's data and kept getting the stop side to increase my stop loss and take profit. Yeah, basing it off percentage isn't a good idea because as the asset changes in price, obviously that percentage distance is going to change as well. So highly recommend not basing it off of percentage in asset. Um, because obviously that's forever fluctuating depending on the price of the asset. You know, I mean, if like US dollar Japanese yen, for example, when you're trading it, we've gone from $115 exchange rate, uh, yen exchange rate to 130 yen exchange rate, right? So we've had a big increase there. So the percentage of a little drop down here was only 1.3%. But if you have a look at the same now, that little drop, 1.8%. So like basing it off of percentage isn't good because it's, affected by the actual price and value of the asset at that time um, and if we're having increased moments of volatility the percentage is going to change a lot more compared to pip value gold i got smoked on gold uh, my analysis on gold did not work out i was looking for a buy in it um, and then i'm pretty sure we're 25th of April. I, I was pretty much looking for a buy. I think it was straight away I was looking for a buy. And um, it just smoked me. It just ripped straight through. So my, my gold analysis this week was no good. I don't like swing trading gold, but um, I gave it a go anyway. And uh, it, ripped, it ripped through me. I don't know if anyone else got their analysis right. We released a chart of the week uh, about here on the 25th. Where are we? 23rd, 23rd, 25th. I oh, know, I was looking to buy here, I think it was. Right here, we released the gold chart and said, share your analysis. 
who you reckon is going to be right. I was looking for a buy along here somewhere. And uh, I think it's fair to say that it, it got absolutely smoked. So I'm happy I didn't actually take a position um, because that wouldn't have ended well for me or my account. But yeah, my, my gold analysis was no good. No good this week. But you want me to have a look at gold? You're in a position for a sell? When did you get in the position? Where did you get in the position? What's your exit plan? Same thing as I spoke to Ty before. What is your exit plan? You've got to have an exit plan. Every single time you trade, invest, buy a property, whatever it might be, have an exit plan. Okay. If you even if that's a little plan, right? Kind of borderline, you still have a process you can follow when that event comes. I've dealt with a lot of people that have done some big investments, right? And they've done an investment and they've been told that it's about to pay, for example, two million dollars. Um, but they reckon they can get it to five million dollars. But when they got in, they said they only wanted a million dollar return. So you see how all of a sudden, oh, they've gotten it to two million. Let's go for five. They're getting that greed. They're getting that. Uh, but if you look back at your exit plan, you said you were happy with one. You've got double what you were happy with. Um, and if we allow the, the net figure to move, if you allow the net figure um, to move your emotion and your decision making, it's going to be a big issue. If you have a um, exit plan for each scenario, what you're going to do under each scenario, there's a good chance your emotions won't send you absolutely insane, and you can effectively make correct decisions consistently with your trading strategy. Can you go over different ways of manually trading from TP and stop loss? Well, I wouldn't trail a take profit um, unless you like your stop loss into take profit. But once again. Uh, it's it's so tough to do that um, because it depends on the strategy you're trading, right? If if you're a little scalper and you're trading on the five minute chart and you're trailing, you stop. You might do it by pips, right? You might do it by candles. You might do it by supply and demand areas, support and resistant areas. Like if, for example, we had a buy, okay, we bought here, and our stop loss was below the recent. Support just down here, and then we moved up. Then you can pull it up under recent support. Then we come in, got another support. You can pull it up under recent support. That's probably how I do it most of the time. Um, and then got out there. But some people like to trail set pips. Um, if you're trading a volatile market, set pips is good because when you want it to run, it should definitely run. If you're trading a really slow market, then maybe you give it a bit more room. Like it all depends on the currency pair you're trading, the time you're trading what strategy you're trading, what you're looking for in trading. Are you fading support and resistance? Are you looking for breakouts and runs? Are you looking for increased volatility? Uh, you, you, while I understand what you're trying to get out of your question, um, very broad area to try and assess, okay? Because there's a million different ways to do it. My best advice would be backtest the best way to do it. Now, you already said you were backtesting back in December. Um, UJ and you got some you know, over 40 trades, your average stop loss, um, which is fantastic. Well done. Especially back testing 40 trades. Try to aim for 100, 100 trades at least before forward testing. Um, and just have a look there. We have a look back over all those trades and find out which trailing stop would have benefited you most. Um, and once you've done that analysis, you'll literally be able to answer that question yourself. You'll be able to stand there and go, yep, I know exactly what. I need to do where where I need to place uh, the different stop losses, where I need to trail it, where I need to put my stop loss because previous data has indicated to you exactly what you need. I hope I hope that makes sense. Okay, as a whole, that's pretty much majority of what I wanted to run through. I'll just check on the yeah. Does anyone have any questions um, or you know, analysis they want to run through, they want to share maybe? Anything that leveled up my risk management system? Ooh, great question. Uh, leveled up risk management was a couple different things. There's a couple different things. That's a, that's a deep question. I like it. Thank you for asking that. that that's a good, good question. Um, 
emotional plays, understanding your emotion in trading and understanding why your emotions tell you different things massively increased my risk management. I used to be a fearful trader. When I'd trade, I'd fear that once we get in the profits, it was going to flip and hit my stop loss. And it would force me to get out of positions early, take half profits. I've told many traders about this before. I've spoken in a live stream about this before. I was a fearful trader. I, I based my decisions once I was in a position off of fear. I'd get out early, um, not wanting it to, to go back and hit my stop loss, right? Um, addressing where that fear was coming from, that fear of failure, and understanding every time I felt that feeling so then I could not ignore it, but I could listen to it, understand what it's trying to tell me, and then base a decision based off of that. Um, that right there was exponential in increasing my, well, increasing my profits, first of all, but also my risk management was, I'd get in positions, I'd be very confident about the position, yep, this is right, this is the position I want to be in. We'd go 30 pips and take, uh, into profit, and I'd instantly start thinking, okay, let's take off half the position. Why on earth was I taking off half the position? I got no idea. My analysis was perfect, right? I, this is what I wanted. Um, I was taking off half the position and then letting it run. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Uh, most of the time it didn't. And I would just be like, why did I take off half the position? So I started writing down my emotions um, when trading, started noting them, what, what I was feeling as I was trying to make these decisions. And I noticed I was actually, I had a, an element of fear every time I made this decision, I was, I was scared. Um, of it coming back down and uh, so I, I dove in and I addressed I addressed where that fear was coming from try to understand why I was fearful at that point in time which was actually uh, for me um, a fear of failing I had a, I had a fear of failing when I was trading I, I built up a lot of self pressure a, a lot of pressure on, on myself which is all pressure is pressure is always only put on yourself no one can put pressure on you um, it's how you accept it you, you mentally stress yourself out um, and I, I put a lot of pressure on myself and I had a fear of failing which which led to me wanting to bank every trade that went into profits early because I didn't want to fail um, once I had addressed that and once I had done everything I needed to with that um every time i then felt that fearful feeling i knew what to do and i knew not to take off half the position and that massively increased my profit even with that fear you know i was still profitably trading um it just i was missing out on a lot more i could have been much better um so so right there that was a big big change that was a big change that's you phil yeah it's, it's a common one it's a very common one i deal with traders all the time and i try to to help them through it and the, and the processes i went through to, to get through and usually Phil, usually it's about addressing something outside of trading, away from trading that uh, you might feel the same emotions for. They're just brought up through trading, um, which is why sometimes trading is so powerful because you have to address yourself and everything around you, not just in trading. Um, the power of one to two risk reward ratio and a decent win rate helped me with that. Yeah, fair enough. Knowing over time my wins overcome the losses, no confidence in trading. No, I had great confidence in the trading plan. I was very confident in the strategy itself. Um, I was just run by emotions once I was in the trade. I'm not a very much, like, I don't love a whole set and forget trading plan. I, I, like, to, I like to manage a position because things change over time when you're in a position. Um, but I just found my emotion was making the decision. So I had confidence in the trading plan. I tested it. I'd run it. I traded it for, like, two and a half years. I was, I was pretty confident with it. Um, and I knew it could sustain long-term long -term profits. But um, I just allowed my emotions to get the better of me. And, and that's something that increased my, my profits. And also the trades I took, I ended up skipping out on a lot of losing trades because I knew that they were losing trades just by assessing my emotion. You saw the answer on the fib and still got out. Yeah, made 66 pips yesterday instead of about 300 on G-Day. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes, sometimes it's a... Uh, yeah, sometimes it's, it's just what it is. <laughs> um, and we have to address why we did it. You know, sometimes you're going you're gonna to get something like that and you're going to be like, why on earth did I just do that? Um, and if you ever feel that way, it's time to start taking things seriously. Start to start having a look. And it's not something technical. Adding a moving average to your chart wouldn't have stopped you from doing that. All right, forget that. Look up here and look in here. That's where your answers lie, 100%. I can tell you that from personal experience. The answers lie in here and up here, not on there. Okay, technical analysis is like 20% of the job. The rest is in here. 
that's actually really powerful that you speak on taking proper early due to external forces. No, I, well, that's that's what I'm here to do. I'm not here to you know willy nilly and faff about. Um, I've been I've been through the journey of, of becoming a profitable trader. I was a retail trader for four years, prop firm trader for two years, still a prop firm trader. Um, it is not an easy gig, but I can share my experience. I can share um, everything I've been through to you know help you as much as possible and, and do as much as I can to, to help you guys progress. And that, that's what I'm trying to do. That's what I'm here to do. Um, and that's the value I want to bring and uh, hopefully it's uh, received received well. I've been getting into the habit of recording myself and why I took a certain trade to see my thought process and how I was feeling. Interesting. Yeah, if you find it more powerful, that's good. Talk, talking it out is definitely good. I recommend doing it as well as journaling because sometimes journaling is easy to pick up patterns. The same way we get written data and numbers in, in trading and we can find a pattern. If we get written data and numbers and emotions in journaling, we can easily find a pattern, especially if you've got someone else to have a look at. Like I deal with a lot of my traders um, that, I, that I help out and they'll send me their trading journal at the end of every week. And I can straight away look through and be like, oh, look, what a coincidence. Every time you lost, you were unconfident in the position. Why did you take the position? S simple things like that. That sometimes all you need is an extra person to look at and go, hey, red flag, why did you do this? And then you go, oh, yeah, I didn't even notice that. And then the next time you feel unconfident in the position, I'm standing over here going, no, <laughs> don't take that trade. You're unconfident. Why did you take that trade? Um, but yeah, like sometimes it, it's good for, for that, that sense too. But I, I like the idea. I like the habit of recording yourself and, and talking through it. And you can actually read body language as well. Um, and you can read emotion and, and see how you're feeling on that day, uh, which is powerful too. Well done. Well done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's definitely a, a, an experience and a journey. Um, yeah, you've got to be, you've got to be fully open with yourself. You've got to be fully committed within and understand yourself quite it's quite confrontational trading sometimes you've got to go through some times where you're the issue and it's so easy for so many people to blame other aspects oh, i didn't know enough about the chart oh the strategy is shit oh you know um of course russia start a war as soon as i buy in a position and that's the reason i've lost a lot of people are very quick to throw the blame elsewhere and if you really want to get back on top of trading without being harmful to yourself and there's a fine balance without being harmful to yourself most of the blame and the fault falls on you so um yeah it's interesting it's interesting there was a discussion on discord about having multiple strategies i know you sometimes scalp in addition to your normal swing method do you have others i think it would be great to have a few in the toolbox one for a ranging market one for a trending market maybe it's targeted for a specific time frame or asset uh yes there was a discussion in the discord about that I do. Sometimes I scalp, sometimes I trade fundamentals, um, and sometimes I swing. So yeah, the analysis between them all are very similar. The scalping trades and the um, swing trades are, are like they're, they're very, very similar, right? The, the way that works is simple to supply and demand spots. Um, the fundamental trades are obviously a lot different because it's based off of data and it's it's not there's no technical uh, technical analysis really involved in doing that. It's all fundamental and based off news release, so a uh, little bit different. But but yeah, like, it is it it is good to have a few in the toolbox once you're ready to have a few in the toolbox. Yeah, get one and get it right. Uh, I see so many traders, they try to bring in this one and bring in that one and bring in that one and then they trade a market for 12 hours a day on a range of different markets trading different strategies and they just get confused and it's just draining and, and then it just builds up this whole range of problems. Like it's taking a leap when you're only ready to take a step. Um, once you've got one strategy set and you're profitably trading and you've got it down pat that you're not making mistakes with it anymore, you're not misreading it, it is what it is and it's set. Then you can start looking, at, okay, maybe I can bring this one in just underneath, you know, or bring this one in just underneath. You don't want to, yeah, you don't want to go too big too early. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Once you've got one set, and if many traders out there might already have one set, um, then then you can assess. Aussie dollar, US dollar here is moving, okay? 
Um, Aussie dollar, US dollars here is moving. So it's a bit early for what I want. We've still got an hour and a half until the PPI data comes out, but it is moving. I'm assuming well, it's at 10 a.m. So the stock market just open up. Yeah, but it's not really doing much. Um, sorry, guys. I'll get back to you in a moment. Why is... Okay, we're having a little bit of a rally, which is okay, as long as it doesn't go too far. Because if it goes too far, it's going to be the price of the PPI already being put in the market. And we'll probably see a sell-off when that data comes out. So we'll keep an eye on it. I'll keep you updated. But, um, yeah, if, if this runs too far today, I'm not going to trade that PPI just because we're already moving a fair bit. 10 pips. Interesting. Uh, do you find supply and demand works better on certain indices or currencies? Uh, sometimes. Uh, time frames, yes. I don't trade indices. Um, but sometimes, some currencies, it depends on the volatility and where the supply and demand area is um, and the fundamentals at the time. you got you to gotta always analyze the fundamentals. But as a whole, no. If, if you have a bias on like, okay, the pound at the moment is really weak, I don't want to buy the pound and the Aussie dollar, um, but the US dollar is really strong. So Great British Pound, US dollar, I want a short, and then you find supply, um, sense, yeah, you find supply areas on that chart, there's a good chance that they're going to work out in, in the way that you want them to. Um, whereas if you're doing it on no fundamental bias, or you just kind of have a look for supply and demand areas, you might see they rip through. But as a whole, uh, no, nah, not really. Um, I don't. I think supply supply and demand is everything in trading. No matter the market, it is a matter of supply and demand. The reason this has gone up is because of demand for the product. The reason this has gone down is because of the supply for the product. It's every market out there is supply and demand. Um, so while you might have to try and find certain areas where whether or not it is actually going to be more demand in the future or not, that's that's where the trick comes in. But everything in trading in every market is supply and demand. In almost every aspect of business in general, it's all supply and demand. Mm. Okay. Well, how are we looking for time? We have been about an hour. Before I wrap it up, does anyone have any questions? I know we've had a great little discussion here, and I, I appreciate all the questions coming through and the nice chat we've had. Do you have any traders, past or present, that have left an impression on me? Negative or positive? Yeah, I've had. I've had many. Um, there's some traders that that just don't have it yet, um, but I just respect them so much, and I can see that they have that 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 quality that they can get there. Uh, and then there's other traders that are absolutely fantastic traders, and the way they do our analysis is brilliant. Uh, but they're not nice people, and um, there, there's a range of different when it comes to impressions on affecting my trading, yeah, there is there is some people. I've got a friend up in uh, up in Sydney who's a, a big prop firm trader up there, and some of the stuff he's told me over the years has revolutionised my trading and, and my career in trading. And uh, there's a million different ways. And and the beauty in trading is there's nothing, there's no wrong answer. There's never a wrong answer. In, in trading because it's an open market that's going to go anywhere and as long as you make money you're right okay so but um there's there's different traders out there that have left a big impression on the other side of talk about the emotional side the the way to go about trading the way to look for it um the way for everything to move there, there are many um and there's some traders i have the privilege to work through with today and and all week that I just love working with. They're just they're just really great people that are so close to being where they want to be. Um, and while I can't give them the answer, they are they are so close. And I try try my hardest to to give them that little nudge. Um, and that that's that's something powerful as well. I love doing that. I love helping those traders achieve that next level, which is why I love doing these live streams because we get to chat all day and I, I can share my story i can share what i've been through and, and a lot of you guys take value from that and learn from that and that's 
powerful in itself and leaves an impression on, on me. Uh, but yeah, the short answer, yes. All the time. Every trader I deal with, I remember with great, um, great memory. I know exactly their struggle points. I know exactly their, uh, their strong points. Um, some, you know, better than others, but yeah, it's definitely, um, it's definitely good. You're awesome, Jordan. You're definitely leaving an impact in the world of trading. Any blessings to you, brother? So happy I got to catch you this live. Thank you very much. That's very, and it's nice to chat to you today. Uh, you're very chatty as well, which is good to see. I appreciate your uh, appreciate your input there. It means a lot. See you, mate. See you later. That is that is going to be it. Does anyone else have any other questions? I know we've just spoke to <laughs> to Albate for a little bit there, uh, but does anyone have any questions that they want answered before I sign off? Any impact? Um, Anything at all? You've got me for two minutes. I'm all yours. I look forward to seeing the stream every week. Thanks, Jordan. No worries, Foreman. I love. Look forward to uh, to chatting to you soon as well. I look forward to it. I always do. I always do. Thank you, Fred. No problem. Thanks for joining. I appreciate you. Uh, I appreciate you being in. I appreciate you all. I know some of you are quite quiet and you like to just sit back and, and watch. And I do appreciate you guys still being here. I hope you take value from these sessions. I'm going to be changing things up in the future. I'm going to be doing a few different little things. Um, if we can find, it, it's tough because of the timing we do it, but if we can find an area in where we can literally trade for an hour, it might be extremely risky because obviously I don't, it won't really coincide with any strategy I have, but if we can find somewhere we can do some live trading, that might be on in the future as well. It could be could be good fun. Um, I'm exploring, I'm exploring different ways. The thing is, most of the little data and stuff comes out later, and it's tough to to coincide into one hour. But we'll figure it out. I think. Keep an eye on Aussie dollar, US dollar. Still expecting very positive news for the PPI. Don't like the way this is moving early. It's probably people getting in early because they're also expecting positive news for the PPI. Uh, but keep an eye on it and we'll see we'll see how it unfolds as always guys have a fantastic trading week over this weekend do me a favor get away from the charts go spend some time with your family go spend some time with your friends come back refreshed on monday and or sunday night depending on where you are in the world and attack the markets with clarity okay have an absolutely fantastic weekend have a great rest of the trading week and as always i'll see you next time thanks guys